this computer. Okay, I believe we are now recording. Um, all right, I think we can get started. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Charles Cheng. I am one of the faculty here at BU Linguistics on the Emerging Scholars Organizing Committee, along with Danny Urker and uh, Kate Lindsay, and um, along with the Colloquium Committee, uh, Megan Brown and Jenya Lukin, we're very happy to welcome you to the fourth talk in our uh, colloquium series for this semester. Um, and we're very excited to have uh, Gladys Camacho Rios here um, and Professor Urker will be introducing her. Perfect. Uh, so I am uh, delighted to welcome uh, Gladys to our colloquium series this afternoon. Uh, Gladys holds a, a BA in Applied Linguistics from the University of San Simon, an MA in Latin American Caribbean Studies from uh, NYU, and an MA in Linguistics from UT Austin. She's currently finishing her doctoral studies at UT Austin under the advisement of Anthony Woodbury. Uh, Gladys describes herself as a community-based language researcher with interests in Quechua phonology, morphology, and language documentation. And this is certainly not an inaccurate description, but I don't think it quite captures what is, to me at least, the most compelling feature of Gladys' scholarly profile, which is an ability to work successfully at different levels of intellectual resolution. So Gladys is, <laughs> I think, as comfortable doing hard-nosed morphophonology as she is engaging in linguistic activism. Uh, for example, in a recent publication in the journal Glossa, Gladys and her co-authors provide an experimentally based account of morphologically sensitive phonotactic restrictions in Bolivian Aymara. Also recently, Gladys guest managed the Act Lenguas Twitter account, bringing attention to the disparity between real life linguistic diversity of Bolivia and the lack of such diversity in virtual life on the net where Spanish dominates. Additionally, as the founder of the Linguistic Summer School in Bolivia, she and her colleagues have, since 2016, provided linguistic training to speakers of indigenous languages and applied linguistic students. Uh, this ability of Gladys is to pivot between micro and macroscopic perspectives, so between theoretical and what, what my, one might call anthropolinguistics, to steal a phrase from, yeah, is, I think, a, a clear benefit to professional linguistic inquiry as well as to the lived experience of language users, in particular older residents of rural areas in the Andean highlands uh, whose ways of speaking are so linguistically precarious and understudied. Uh, in addition to her linguistic work, Gladys is a novelist and short story writer. She's regularly sought out by media outlets for her opinions on language and linguistics, and she is the winner of numerous grants and awards, including recently a doctoral dissertation research improvement grant from NSF. We're very, very fortunate to have her with us here today as she presents research on morphological variation in South Bolivian Quechua. Please join me in making a few welcome. Um. Um, gracias. In Imenalia Noga, my Kusisra, Tashani Ranguna, Kai Invitariku as Raichi Manta, Noga Investigation is Nimanta, Tumbitaya Taps Kunam Punche, Parlarisa, uh, Kunan Kunan Tardepi Noga, Kai Bolivia, Andes Nimanta Pacha, Parlarimos Aikichi. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very honored and thank you so much for that introduction. Today, I will be sharing a little bit of my research with you. Uh, I will be speaking from the Andes of Bolivia. This is the region where we, the Quechua people, live. I will share my screen. And Computer audio. Okay, that's talk. Okay. Ooh. Oh, I need to make full screen. Is it full screen now? Perfect. Today I will talk about morphological variation in South Bolivian Quechua. I will show variation in the use of complex verb morphology between monolingual and Quechua Spanish bilinguals. Uh, this analysis is 
based on a corpus study recordings of spontaneous conversations. Hmm. Oh, okay. This is the presentation plan that I have for today. I will first give a short summary of the language background. Then I will talk about the motivations of this study. I will define the characteristics between monolingual and bilingual speakers. Then I will talk about morphological variation among these speakers. And then I will give a statistical comparison of them. I will then illustrate three aspects that vary between these two groups. I will provide some insights on South Bolivian Quechua typology. Finally, the conclusions. Uh, language background. Quechua is a language family spoken across the Andes of South America, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and parts of Colombia and Argentina. There are at least 13 different Quechua languages, six languages in the north, four languages in the central area, and three in southern Andes. The arguments for the existence of 13 different Quechua languages are based on the language's mutual intelligibility and linguistic features. My country, <clears throat> well, my, my work takes place in Bolivia. Bolivia is a linguistically diverse country. It has more than 30 native languages and 20 families, including some isolates. Uh, native languages in Bolivia are located in four regions, Amazonia, the Oriente or Chiquitania, the Chaco region, and the Andes. Quechua is spoken in the Andes of Bolivia. Two varieties of one single Quechua language are spoken in Bolivia, the Northern and the Southern. They are mutually intelligible with small differences at different levels. For instance, phonetic, morphological, lexical. Bolivian Quechua has approximately 2 million speakers across the country. My work focuses on South Bolivian Quechua spoken in Cochabamba department. My study has two motivations. First, the first one has to do with my observations being an L1 speaker of South Bolivian Quechua. The second one is concerned with my own observations on Bolivian Quechua grammar compared to previous works on South Bolivian Quechua. I'm an L1 speaker of Quechua. I was born and raised in a rural town. My grandparents and my mother are monolingual in Quechua. They do not speak Spanish. Um, I'm fluent in Quechua. Well, that doesn't make me an expert to explain the grammar of my native language. Quechua is a polysynthetic language. Verb forms can be expanded through suffixation. In, in Quechua, I can say examples as in one, which means I ate uh, or I eat. But if I add this, the associated motion suffix, mu, after the verb root, as in two, mikumuni, that means I went and ate somewhere else. And if I keep elaborating and add two suffixes to the verb root, mikuchimuni, as in three, and that means I went to fed someone else. <sighs> However, verbal morphology in South Bolivian Quechua can be even more complex. As in four, Kuti Pushargani, I was bringing my sheep, sheep back home, where four derivational suffixes combine to the verb root to form a verb stem. To my L1 intuitions and to someone with monolingual grandparents and a monolingual mother, this, these forms are mostly present in the speech of monolinguals. Such forms are not quite visible in the speech of Quechua Spanish bilinguals. This is something that I wanted to understand and be able to explain also what those complex verb forms mean or what particular information they convey. But it's not just the linguistic difference. Monolingual speakers are talented storytellers. To my observation, their Quechua system is particular. Their verbs are use more derivational morphology. They use greater metaphoric expressions in their speech. They also display recurrent figures of verbal art that is not observed in the speech of bilinguals. I will come back to this later. However, these varieties are not well studied. There are no documentation projects 
to record and preserve monolingual varieties. In most cases, the way monolingual speak is not being passed to younger generations due to out of town migration. This makes me claim that monolingual varieties are in danger of disappearing towns as towns decrease in population. And sadly, there will not be records left about their unique Quechua system for future generations. This will lead to a significant loss of linguistic diversity of Bolivian Quechua. South Bolivian Quechua has a good amount of linguistic studies, but almost all studies have been conducted with Quechua Spanish bilinguals and, and in urbanized areas. Today, the Quechua of bilinguals has a good amount of studies, both descriptive and theoretical. There are no studies on South Bolivian Quechua spoken by monolinguals in rural areas while analyzing how people speak in their day-to-day -day life. Indeed, studies on South Bolivian Quechua normally went through elicitation. This means mediated through Spanish in order to learn about the structure and the Quechua grammar. The problem is also we don't have many L1 speakers of Quechua involved in linguistic research. Therefore, there are no studies on monolingual Quechua conducted while speaking all in Quechua with elders who are currently the last monolingual speakers. Um, being familiar uh, with, the way, with the way my grandparents and my mother speak Quechua made me aware that South Bolivian Quechua is not uniform. I figured out the verb template proposed by earlier scholars doesn't quite represent the way monolinguals speak. I, I will show details on this later. To my L1 intuition, the variation is visible in three ways. In the order of suffixes, the slot organization and the compositional meaning of suffix strings, the complexity of verb morphology. For this presentation, I will, I will focus in this last one. I mentioned earlier that there's variation in the order of suffixes between the verb template proposed by earlier scholars and the one I proposed for monolingual Quechua. If we look at this example from Muiskin, the suffix naya precedes mu. But Here's an example from monolingual Quechua in which the proposed order varies. While verb template organization states naya preceding the mu suffix called cislocative, as in paranaya mushan, it's about to rain, the monolingual data proposes the other way around in which mu precedes the suffix naya, as in akarikamu naya shalyang nyatah, and it the cloud is about to fall downwards once again. Earlier studies on South Bolivian Quechua verb morphology propose a slot organization. This means whenever suffixes will co-occur, the meaning of the suffixes will be compositional. However, when certain suffixes co-occur, no longer denote compositional meaning. For instance, in 10, the suffix capu supposedly is composed by a co-reflexive and as illustrated in eight, and the pu suffix and benefactive as in nine. But when they co occur and the reflexive ku undergoes vowel change, the meaning is no longer compositional. There are many of those suffixes that I will be calling complex suffixes throughout my talk. Complex suffixes like kapu actually will form a single constituent as in a rather than two separate constituents as in B. I claim that monolingual verbs are more complex than the verbs of bilingual speakers in natural conversations. Bilinguals normally have the basic structure as in 11, which is composed by a root inflection, the two basic units of a verb form, whereas monolinguals have more derivational morphology in their verbs as marked in blue in 12. For this presentation, I did a corpus study to examine the exponents of derivational verbal morphology between monolinguals and bilinguals before jumping into the real study and the variation observations. 
I want to first talk about the methodology of my work. I'm a documentary linguist. My field work consists in documenting the speech of elders in every everyday conversations. Since I'm, uh, since I'm fluent in Quechua, I speak in Quechua with elders and I take audio and video recordings of our conversations. My consultants are very old people. All of them are 74 or older. Here's an example of a natural conversation with one of my consultants. He's 74 years old and he, in this video, he's talking about bad weather conditions that sometimes damage the crops. Here's another example with another consultant. She is 90 years old. The conversation is about the rain. She and her 60 year old son are arguing whether it will rain or not. Most of my video documentation materials capture spontaneous conversations in day-to-day -day life, but I also document elders working the land. Here's another example of one of my consultants working the land when potato plantations are growing. I also audio document our day-to-day -day conversations. To date, I have documented 47 hours in total between audio and video. My documentation is complemented with elicitation. Monolinguals only speak Quechua. I figured out one good elicitation technique that worked very well so far. For each elicitation session, I prepare a list of verbs. Each verb contains particular derivation or morphology that I want to fully understand. I pronounce one verb form at a time and ask elders, how can we speak in Quechua using um, what I just said? They use the verb form in a phrase, including a context. I use my, my L1 intuitions uh, to analyze the data. Most of the data I collected has been transcribed in Elan with the assistance of four native speakers of Quechua. Two of the arrays I hired actually became passionate pioneers in monolingual Quechua documentation, and they both were accepted in grad school in the US for next academic year. After transcribing in Elan, the data has been manipulated in Python. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the differences between these two groups. The main characteristics to distinguish these two groups are based on <clears throat> geographical location, rural versus urban, language only Quechua for monolinguals and Quechua Spanish for bilinguals, education known for monolinguals and university education for bilinguals, age um, old versus young. Uh, concerning geographical location, monolingual speakers for this study live in a rural town at a further distance from the city or urban area. The town where they live has no kids, no school. They are not in contact with Spanish in their day-to-day -day life. Um, they only speak Quechua. They are all elderly people. Based on the eight-hour data I have, I will classify bilinguals in two groups. Even though my study 
and compares monolinguals and bilinguals. I will show the reasons for this classification later on. The first group of bilinguals are the ones originally from a rural town. They were born and raised in a rural town until certain age, um, approximately five or six before moving to the city of Cochabamba. The rural bilinguals spoke Quechua before school. They learned Spanish at school. They moved to the city of Cochabamba and finished co college education there. They attended university education. They are exposed to Spanish in their everyday life. The second group of bilinguals are originally from the urban area of Cochabamba. Cochabamba has five neighborhoods that compose the area, the urban area. They learn Quechua at home. They acquired Spanish and Quechua pretty much simultaneously. And despite being exposed to both languages, they are Spanish dominant. They attended school and university in Spanish. Spanish is their everyday language to which they are mostly exposed. So what's the variation between these two groups? Um, I claim that the lexical diversity of derivational suffixes, the semantic complexity of them, and the propensity of use of them varies between monolinguals and bilinguals. Monolinguals use more morphology of one suffix, two suffixes, three suffixes, whereas bilinguals tend to use the basic structure root inflection. Uh, the 16 hour corpus I examined will allow me to verify this. Before getting into the real analysis, I would like to give a short introduction of what the verbal morphology looks like and what suffixes look like. For both groups, ver verbal words are minimally composed of a verb root, which is always initial, as in yellow, and one inflectional bound morpheme, which marks person number tense and mood. Um, additional derivational suffixes can appear on the verb stem to convey causative, associative, causation, lo locative, spatial, affective, manner, and other meanings. Derivational suffixes can be of two types, simplex and complex. Simplex suffixes, as the ones in red, are normally monosyllabic, except naya or raya. Simplex suffixes bear compositional meanings when they co-occur with another simplex suffix or with a complex suffix. Whereas complex suffixes are lexicalized units that no longer have a compositional meaning. They bear a, a complex meaning as a unit. I will give you some examples to see this difference. If we look at these examples in, in 12, the co reflexive suffix and the and in 13, the proven and effective suffix uh, have a compositional meaning. However, when certain simplex suffixes co-occur, they form complex suffixes. Complex suffixes have several characteristics. First, they involve vowel change. They no longer present a compositional meaning and as separate suffixes. Synchronically, they are fossilized units and they represent a single constituent as in A and not three separate constituents as in B. For this study, I looked at 16 hour corpus, eight hour collected with monolingual in, in a rural town and eight hour with bilingual speakers in, in an urban area of Cochabamba. The content of both corpora is spontaneous conversations in both corpora emerge oral stories. Uh, first, all the verb forms were extracted from the corpus using Python. I separated the suffix strings to make the corpus, the counts easily manageable. Derivational suffixes range from zero up to four derivational suffixes and the maximum that can occur in a verb form. Uh, third, I added different variables to the CSV document. These variables were language, whether the verb corresponds to a bilingual or, or monolingual, the bird town, whether the speaker is originally from a rural town or the urban area, and so on. I also had another 
variable for complex surface. Here is a bar graph representation of the total count of derivational suffixes comparing these two groups. Each bar shows the mean proportion of all verbs with the suffix count for the group. Zero means there is no derivational suffix in the verb form because that verb form is composed by the minimal component root inflection. One stands for one suffix, two stands for two suffixes, and so on. The suffixes in those positions can be either simplex or complex. The differences between monolinguals and bilinguals are visible, as we can see. Uh, well, statistical analysis. Taken as variable language, monolingual, bilingual, and tone as a fixed effect, a statistical model in ANOVA has been designed to see whether there's significant difference statistically on the total count of derivational suffixes between the verbs of these two groups. The variable language, monolingual versus bilingual, uh, predicts variation in the number of derivational suffixes. This difference is statistically highly significant. Monolinguals are more likely to have more derivational suffixes. Actually, 14 complex suffixes are not found in the eight-hour corpus of bilinguals. Um, the, the complex suffixes that do not appear in the corpus of bilinguals normally denote meanings related to associated motion, deictic, and adverbial adverbials. Monolinguals use more complex suffixes, suffixes and complex suffix types than bilinguals. Based on the count of complex suffixes, the observed complex suffixes for bilinguals are normally linked to the bilinguals who were born in a rural town. Beyond that, monolinguals use more suffix strings. Uh, I will illustrate three aspects that vary in the verbal morphology <clears throat> between monolinguals and bilinguals. On the 16-hour corpus study, the suffix campu is only observed for monolinguals. I mentioned earlier that complex suffixes have a meaning as a unit and not as two or three separate simplex suffixes. One of these suffixes is rogakapu, denoting a maleffective meaning in context. This complex suffix is only observed for monolinguals and for bilinguals who are originally from a rural town. But this suffix is not observed for bilinguals from urban areas. I have also mentioned that some suffix strings observed only for monolinguals are characterized to denote parallelism of verbal art. I will illustrate two of them, ricamu and ricapu, that denote two themes of verbal art. These strings are idiosyncratic to the speech of monolinguals. Associated motion or the fact of motion in South Bolivian Quechua can be encoded grammatically by simplex and complex suffixes. According to Guillaume 2016, associated motion morphemes express motion, spatial, uh, displacement, change of location. However, associated motion has been loosely studied and to date remains largely unknown in linguistics. South Bolivian Quechua has three types of associated motion, prior, concurrent, and subsequent. Prior and concurrent motion is expressed by both simplex and complex suffixes. I will give you three examples of each type. Then I will show you the variation of associated motion conveyed by two complex suffixes. Um, prior motion means that the subject goes and does the verb uh, in a specific location, as in 15. Now I will go and feed the sheep. The suffix mu combined to activity verbs will trigger prior motion. The suffix licenses a locative argument in which verb will take place. Concurrent motion means to do verb while go, going or moving, as in 16. Erasmo huasin kamatangamuni. I pushed the tank until Erasmus' house. 
This meaning is expressed by mu combined with verbs containing lexical semantics. Uh, the suffix will license an ablative or an allative argument or both in order to state whether the verb event start where the verb event starts and where it ends. <clears throat> Concurrent motion is additionally expressed by, by the suffix yacha, interpreted according to the specific verb type and the spatial environment. The first concurrent motion takes place in, in a nonlinear non direction in, and in a wider space as in 17. Paspa al mapu The paspa bird carries the soul of a human with it as it flies. This meaning is normally interpreted when yacha combines two verb roots with path meaning in their lexical semantics. The second meaning is interpreted in a narrower space and when it combines with verbs that do not contain mm, pad in their lexical semantics as in 18. My uh, campis. Even now she's thinking as it moves from place to place. I wonder where she comes from. The concurrent motion occurs in a narrower space. The motion is nonlinear and it's interrupted. Subsequent motion is expressed in a paraphrastic construction. Itawankama plus the verb. It means do the verb and then go away, as in 19. He put his yihya as if it was a scarf, and then he went away. I mentioned earlier monolinguals use a bigger system of associated motion complex suffixes. This suffix kampu has only been observed by monolinguals. The, corpu, the complex suffix kampu denotes either prior or concurrent motion, depending on the type of verb root it combines to. Additionally, it will provide us information on the subject and the possessed object. There are three types of prior motion and two types of concurrent motion. The difference is in the way the, the subject possesses the object. I will illustrate each one with one example found in the monolingual corpus. The first prior motion means the subject possesses the object. Uh, for example, in 20, uh, when the wheat grows, they go and thresh their wheat. The wheat belongs to the subject the wit is already in the place where the subject will go and perform the verb. The second one uh, means the subject takes with him the possessed object. Um, for example, in 21, when my clothes become dirty, I go wash my clothes. The subject takes the possessed object, in this case, his clothes, <clears throat> the third one means the subject goes, becomes possessor of the object, and does the verb. For example, in 22, I went and cut off the straw from that crack. The subject goes and does the verb, and he becomes the possessor of the object. Nobody else owned the straw before. Um, and then what happens for bilinguals? I mentioned earlier that this suffix is not observed for bilinguals. Bilinguals would use the single form of prior motion, mu, to convey similar information as in 23. And I went go wash clothes. Um, the complex suffix also triggers two types of concurrent motion. The first one means take the possessed object while going. For example, in 24, There I brought my ship carrying by hand. That night, the fox took it away. The subject brings the possessed object while it comes. Um, the next one means concurrent motion while taking uh, the recently possessed object. 
the, uh, the subject takes it as it goes the recently possessed object, as in 26. Kunang hinatacho a pasajimana zahta re nis pila huakione pila skata abakampuni. What should I do now? Saying, I try to pluck. I brought it plucked. He's talking about the quail. The subject killed the quail in his way. He became the possessor of the quail and took it with him. Uh, I forgot to mention that in Bolivia, in rural towns, we eat quails. Um, I want to give you two more examples with another complex prior motion suffix. The suffix triggers uh, prior motion, but in addition to that, it involves deictic information such as inside, as in 27. <clears throat> you will go save your backpack inside the room as you enter the room to sleep. The speaker is suggesting the addressee to save her backpack inside the room as she enters that room to sleep. However, when the complex suffix yakampu combines two verbs, involving path in their lexical semantics. The meaning involves go from inside, do the verb, come back to original place as in 28. That thing of mine, my fumigator, I will go and break, bring it inside. The speaker is inside the room. I was actually with him in that moment. The motion will involve going from inside outside where the fumigator is, take the possessed object and return inside the original place where the speaker was. The corpus study shows that there is variation in the way suffixes are used by bilingual and monolingual speakers. Monolinguals use a bigger system of complex suffixes to convey additional meanings such as the ichthic, the implication of the subject in owning the object while performing the verb, whereas bilinguals will use the simplex for mu to convey similar information. Complex suffixes convey a meaning as a unit. Compositional meanings, uh, as stated in, in earlier studies for Bolivian Quechua, the complex suffix ergacapu has a meaning related to malefactive. It's also context dependent. Opposite to benefactive and malefactive means the semantic role of the person who is harmed. This complex suffix is only observed for monolinguals and for bilinguals who are originally from a rural town. This is the reason I separated earlier my bilingual speakers in two groups the ones who were born in a rural town and the ones who were born in an urban area. Indeed, some complex suffixes observed in the speech of bilinguals normally correspond to the ones coming from rural areas. Quechua has a benefactive meaning expressed to, through the suffix pu, as in 29, they set up tents for us in the speech of bilinguals, and as in 30, I made him cinnamon till I quickly cook him lunch. The benefactive suffix pu increases balance by one who will get the benefit out of the verb. Opposite to the benefactive, a malefactive meaning is interpreted from a complex suffix and pragmatically inferred by context. Mm, first, well, I need to convince you that this complex suffix is not composed out of three simplex suffixes, but it's rather a lexicalized unit with malefactive meaning. To support my claim, I will use as evidence the reflexive and the benefactive suffixes bearing compositional meanings when combined to activity verbs. In 31, the basic verb form Tunas Bayang means he picks prickle peers um, in 32. If we add a reflexive suffix, Tunas Bayakun, it means he picks prickle peers himself. And in 33, if we add the benefactive pu suffix, Tunas Bayapun, it will mean he picked prickle peers 
uh, for someone else or for the benefit or of someone else. However, in 34, the suffix ergakapu no longer denotes the compositional counterparts for the individual suffixes, despite combining to an activity verb type. I will support my claim using three arguments, semantic, phonological, and morphosyntactic. First, this complex suffix has a meaning as a unit. We can't interpret a, a reflexive or a benefactive meaning separately. My second argument to claim this is a compositional meaning includes phonological evidence. There's vowel change from U to A uh, in, in two of the suff suffixes. When this change happens, the meaning is best interpreted as, as a unit and no longer compositional. The third argument is morphosyntactic. The benefactive pool can license a direct object as stated in Mylar 2016. If we look at example 35, Tunas Palyapua, that means he picked me, Prico Pierce. However, the complex suffix ergakapu can no longer license an indirect object. We cannot say examples as in 36. Tunas Palyapuan is totally ungrammatical. So I think that stands for a morphosyntactic argument. Uh, Ergakapu has a maleffective meaning. For example, in 38, they watered their crops with a portion of water assigned to me. The speaker said someone else took his portion of water to water his or her crops. I mentioned earlier, opposite to benefactive and maleffective means for the person who is harmed. In Quechua, this meaning is, is expressed to the suffix, to the complex suffixes, it's also deduced by context in which the speaker is the, the one who is harmed. As I mentioned earlier, this complex suffix is observed in the speech of monolinguals and also in the speech of um, bilinguals who are originally from a rural town. Lastly, verbal art, recurrent figures in the speech of monolinguals. As stated in Scherzer, speech play and verbal art involves language in its essence. The artistic creativity will constitute the richest point between language, culture, society, and individual expression. Certain suffix strings in the speech of monolinguals are characterized to denote recurrent figures of parallelism of verbal art. I want to clarify that those strings were not observed in the eight hour corpus of bilinguals. Additionally, these recurrent figures are inferred by context. I will illustrate two themes I have observed in the monolingual corpus, Rikamu denoting a theme of happiness and Rikapu denoting a theme of audacity. Rikamu is characterized as a recurrent figure of parallelism denoting a theme of happiness. This meaning is interpreted from the context. The context in which this emerged is related to carnivals. It's the rainy season. The harvest is almost ready already. Carnivals is a result of syncretism, but people still celebrate the abundance of harvest <clears throat> with traditional chicha, an alcoholic beverage made from corn. In example 39, this recurrent figure emerged lined up in a song. Takirikamusun, tusurikamusun, kait ahrapam papi, bailarikamusun. We will happily go sing, we will happily dance in this flat lawn, we will happily dance. However, this figure also appears in daily conversations and also line up as in the earlier example. In my homeland, I would go and happily make chicha. I would happily sing. I would happily have a joyful moment. Another suffix string to create verbal art is rikapu. This suffix 
The suffix string emerges in traditional narratives and it denotes a theme of audacity. In Quechua narratives, animals compete a lot. One of the characters is in the story is more clever and it cheats or wins over the other. In 41, it, the rabbit entered at one, once, it escaped at once, he, the man didn't chase it. In this example, the rabbit wins, it escapes. To summarize this part, some suffix strings in the speech of monolinguals are used in a specific context to create verbal art surrounding different themes in South Bolivian Quechua. Such suffix strings are not observed in the corpus that corresponds to bilinguals for this study. So what are my new insights for Quechua typology? To date, we have been considering South Bolivian Quechua as one single variety without paying attention to morphological differences. A way of rethinking South Bolivian Quechua typology between urban standard and rural natural dialects might involve considering uh, the following. We would consider a variable between rural and urban speakers of South Bolivian Quechua and the distinct complex suffixes exhibited in the morphology of these two groups of speakers and the geography where, they, where the speakers lead. Similarly, the verbal morphology and suffix strings that varies between these two groups, urban and rural speakers, social factors such as age, because this can be a factor that influences morphological variation, therefore variation at different grammatical categories. The linguistic background, because uh, the fact that monolinguals only speak Quechua and bilinguals are mostly Spanish dominant can also influence morphological variation. Well, to conclude, uh, the corpus study revealed variation in the use of complex verb morphology between monolinguals and bilinguals. This difference is statistically significant on the total count of derivational suffixes. Monolinguals exhibit more derivational verb morphology in their verbs, whereas bilinguals have a small inventory of derivational suffixes. Uh, certain suffix strings characterized to denote verbal art are idiosyncratic to monolinguals. Similarly, recalling associated motion grammatical category, monolinguals have a bigger system compared to bilinguals. And I want to highlight, this is not the only aspect that varies, there are many more. Oh, oops, sorry. I still have, <laughs> but um, I want to mention that um, in-depth studies looking at individual suffixes or suffix strings between these two groups still need further exploration. Similarly, studies to understand different varieties like rural varieties are still needed because urban, urban Quechua varieties appear to be well-documented and well understood, but variation in rural towns is less documented and rural varieties have no have more, have more morphology. Well, I just want to thank you, the monolingual speakers uh, in the rural town that I work and also to the audience for your time and for your patience with my English. And also I would like to thank the funding agency that supports economically my work. And if you have some comments or questions, um, they are welcome. Thanks so much, Gladys. Um, I am going to open the floor for questions um, and I'll just stop the recording um, and let's give our speaker a virtual round of applause. <laughs> um.